So the next real question, though, I mean, getting to other things. I mean, we know that trastuzumab works really well, but now we have, it looks like, it may get approval, um, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. You know, we have neratinib. And so I'm curious about people's thoughts about the Exonet trial, where this is going, you know, the data that was presented at San Antonio about management of the diarrhea in a, in a trial. You know, what do people think? I mean, are, you know, so just to kind of explain, I guess, to the, to the group, you know, Exonet, you know, was a trial where people had the standard therapy for their disease, and then within a year of finishing, you know, so they could have had at least up to two years after, finish, after getting their adjuvant chemotherapy, um, and a, within a year of finishing their adjuvant trastuzumab, they could be randomized to um, placebo or to um, ratnib. And in the study, there was a small but significant benefit. I mean, everybody did really well, but there was a small but significant benefit, as Kim was mentioning, in the ER positive subgroup. I mean, it was probably like a 3% or 2% absolute benefit at 40 years in terms Five of disease-free survival. You know, so what do you think? You know, should, what do you think of Extinet? Are you guys going to, I mean, assuming it gets approved, would you use it and in what patients? Yeah, I think the data is a bit compelling for the ER positive or 2 positive group. Uh, because that's where you could really see the benefit. And as Kim was mentioning earlier, there is at least a lot of preclinical data of this crosstalk between ER and HER2. So you could make a case that, oh, potentially that's why it's working and we should be using it in this setting. The, the challenge is the potential toxicity with the diarrhea being uh, the most common side effect. And also, you know, at the end of one year, patients are usually tired with the anti-HER2 therapy and they feel great that, oh, you've completed all your trastuzumab and if you're ear positive, you just need to continue an AI uh, and that's more of an insurance policy. But here to say that you need a second agent that you'll have to continue for an additional one year, I think that'll play into the decision making. Mm -hmm. Other comments? Uh, yeah, I mean, we really are sort of create. I mean, we're turning ER positive breast cancer into a real chronic disease, right? I mm -hmm. mean, which which may be appropriate, but if you think about it from the patient's perspective, it's two years of anti HER2 therapy plus minus chemotherapy before it, and then now five to ten years worth of anti estrogen therapy. I mean, this is now something that's going to be treated for. Do you have a group that you would treat, Kim, with this? Um, if it gets approved, I will offer it to all of my patients. Everybody, even someone who has a one. We'll have an educated discussion. Yeah, really? because you know what? It was the ER positive patients that drive the benefit. Really? And I don't know yeah. what, what the patients are like in Boston, but in my patient population, when it gets time to that end of the year of Herceptin, trastuzumab, there's this moment of, especially patients whose tumors melted away if they got neoadjuvant therapy, why don't we continue it? I get asked that all the time. You know, are you sure that this is all I need? Right. Um, diarrhea is a horrible thing, life-altering thing. We do have data with the neuratinib that you can control it. It reminds me of the CPT-11 days where you just had to have a prophylactic schedule. And, you know, we've given the drug and the metastatic early. You've got to have a diarrhea diary. Isn't that clever? And the nurses <laughs> really love it. You know, I mean, none of us likes talking about diarrhea. But it's that a different kind of diarrhea, minutes. too, isn't it? It's not like the explosive, just more stools. I mean, we've all learned with grade three. I just, it's eight more than seven stools yeah. a day is grade three or something? Yeah, yeah more yeah, than right. six, yeah. Oh, so, more than six, okay, sorry. Anyway, the bottom line is, is that, again, and it goes back to why we give trastuzumab, to all HER2 positive patients for the most part is that if the study, we now have five years of follow-up. You know, at two years, I kind of scratched my head and said, oh, the curves are going to come back together. There's something funky going on. We have five years of follow-up and the curves remain separated. So I can't explain why it only works in ER positive, but if the indication is for all HER2 positive early stage breast cancer, especially if we don't see a survival detriment. We haven't seen the survival, but the FDA is going to require that for a label. Um, I think you're obligated to discuss it, just like you're obligated to discuss continuing tamoxifen after five years and an AI after five years. Our patients do want to participate in that. It's our job is to help them participate in these decisions. I'm going to have plenty of patients who say, you got to be crazy. You're going to help two women, and you're going to give 15 diarrhea, that, mm -hmm. the dose... There will be patients that say that, but I will feel obligated to at least discuss it and document it in my note. So you practice in the city, Mark, yeah. where patients want very aggressive therapy. So how do you feel about this? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it's, I think our practice is probably no different from yours, which is yeah. that it's very variable, right? Yeah. I mean, some people do, some people don't. And if you take this group of patients that you, we talked about a little bit ago, you know, small node-negative HER2-positive tumors who are 96 to 98% 
likely to survive free of disease with a year's worth of trash. It's going to be pretty hard to sell. You know, right, that's year not going to lie. That's, my, that's why patients. I say that's why I was kind of surprised. I mean, I mean, someone who comes up with a big tumor, you give them chemo, a lot of it's left. Right. I would be more excited right. about doing that. Or even the ones who come in with you know big tumor, no positive disease, and have a good initial that's response, right? You say. still I'd be might more worry enthusiastic about, that. about really? those. If that okay. tumor melts away on her two base therapy, mm -hmm. I'd be even more. And the the patients that it doesn't melt away, then I'd be less enthused. I mean, I think we have an in vivo sensitivity assay to what, which tumors are HER2 addicted. That's my favorite term. You can say HER2 enriched, right. or that yeah. sounds a little bit more elegant. But the reality is when tumors melt away to TRAS or TRAS-pertuzumab, that's a HER2 addicted tumor. We saw that from the Lapatinib days. Yep. And I think, you know, that will also affect perhaps the, the <coughs> results we'll finally see, hopefully one day of the affinity study, is that there was probably a lot of HER2 non-enriched or HER2 non-addicted mm -hmm. tumors in that study, and it clearly affects our ability to see the benefits of adding pertuzumab in the adjuvant setting. So again, I practice very practically, which is I offer it, and at least in the setting of neratinib, if they get diarrhea and they don't want to continue it, we stop it. It's not, yeah. you know, unless we see a survival detriment, there's a lot of things that we do in medicine that require over-treatment of a population of patients. But for that individual patient sitting in front of me who I want to be able to say, we've done everything within reason to prevent your breast cancer from coming back, I think offering neratinib in that setting, if it's approved and it's not a financial burden, huge financial burden to the patient, I'll offer it. 